she has um, observed a lot of the things that go on with dentists and patients. And uh, we'll give us some insights as to what patients go through and also some of the things that you have to be aware of in your own psyche uh, so as not to get bent out of shape unnecessarily. And um, she always has a really, uh, some very good tidbits for you to keep in mind as you're working with patients and uh, you know, working with them and just doing what you just need to do. So uh, I really appreciate her coming and talking with us every year. And she um, you know, is a busy, busy person, but uh, takes that time to work with us. And we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Lowe always took you the nicest introduction ever, right? <laughs> so I appreciate that. Um, so nice to see you guys again in the space, right? I hope everybody's happy. I know uh, this uh, change, change like this is not always easy or smooth. So you guys look pretty cheerful. So you're doing okay. Um, so my job today is to talk to you. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Yes? Okay. <laughs> back. Um, talking about psychological factors and complete measures construction. So what I'm hoping to accomplish is to step away from the technical aspects. Um, and you're working very, very hard in the lab and in the classroom to learn how to make a good, high-quality denture for your patients, right? And that is critical. What I want you to do is just mentally step away from that for a second and think about we're going to spend Probably 40 minutes thinking about your patient's experience of tooth loss and of getting a new denture. So not the technical side, but kind of the emotional and psychological side of what's going on. So to sensitize you to the emotional impact of tooth loss and adaptation to complete dentures, what are your patient's experience? Um, most of you probably have not lost teeth. Is that accurate? I was the victim of uh, premolar extractions in orthodontics when I was 14, um, so I was in a few teeth by design. Um, but um, for most of us, this is probably not something we spend a lot of time talking about. You may have some relatives who've lost some teeth. Um, whether or not we talk to them about that or not is, is uh, unknown. So, and then we want to think about whether or not patients who um, will have difficulty adapting to a complete denture can be identified ahead of time. So are there, are there red flags, are there warning signs that you could look for that would say, oh boy, um, this person may have a problem getting, getting used to this uh, denture I'm going to make for them. And then finally, I want to talk about your side of this, what's going on with you when you're trying to do really good treatment for someone and maybe they're struggling to adapt and what does that do to you. All right, so we're going to do a little discussion here. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to turn to a partner and just spend a couple of minutes oops, um, thinking about and talking about these questions. Slides you have one here. If you lost your teeth, what thoughts or feelings do you think you would experience? Which is question one. If you lost your teeth, how would that impact you in terms of function? And what challenges do you think there are getting used to in prosthesis on a scale of 1 to 10, where 10 is extraordinarily difficult and 1 is very easy? What would you expect that number would be? So take, let's take about five minutes, turn to the partner and have some discussion, then we'll, we'll come back to the group. In terms of okay. positive feelings, you lost some teeth or all your teeth? Uh -oh. You can be really self-conscious. I would be really self-conscious. Self-conscious, okay. Worthless. Worthless. <laughs> so pretty, pretty, pretty significant emotion. Yeah, I think you'd be pretty harmful to yourself. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Absolutely. What else? Pardon? I should have lost. I should have lost. Actually, really, very clever. But really good, right? Regret, right? Why didn't I do something to change this? If they have pain, probably the patient will feel they're uh, relieved. 
okay, great, on the positive side, I was in pain, I was having all these problems with my knees, so some patients are going to feel a sense of relief, right? Yeah. Now I don't have to deal with that. How would people look at me and like, you know, in pictures and stuff? Right. Yeah, Self-conscious about that. Self-consciousness, how am I going to look in photos? How are other people looking at me? Absolutely. Are they noticing? Are they judging me? Okay. Uh, impact on function. Ideas about that. How would this impact your function in the world? Or would it? What about your speech? Speech. Okay. The things that you can eat, like hard nuts. Yeah. Okay, so you have to be careful about what you reach for to eat. Peanuts, walnuts, apples, but I need to know it's apple season, right? Has anyone been in passion fruit farm to get that crisps? <laughs> yes. <laughs> if you have it, you must go. Uh, but bite into that apple. And what else? So we have speech and eating. Anything else? Um, how big of a challenge is this? Ten is monumental challenge, one is easy. What would you predict? I think dentures compared to a new leg is not nearly as bad, but <laughs> <laughs> there are lots of different processes. Losing an arm would be a lot harder. Okay. So interesting putting this in the same category as other loss of body parts, right? things that happen, we don't necessarily always think of this in that category, but it really is, right? Anybody want to put a number on this? Functionally or psychologically? Just overall. A six? Okay. So pretty difficult. Anybody else? Seven. So we're at for 10 years, this seems like it would be pretty tough. Right. Okay, so. I would have said three. A three. three. Okay, all right, so we've got a range of opinion. And actually, what, what we will find out as we go through is that there is a range. And that's one of the things I want you to appreciate is that we're going to come up with this very differently. And you're going to get some people for whom it is a three. It's like, no big deal, I'm moving on and other people for whom it is a 7, 8, 9, 10. And so being aware um, and not expecting the 7 to react like 3, right? Um, but as an understanding there's individual difference. Okay, so I uh, want you to think about problems. There are two types of problems in the world. This is from a book on leadership by Ron Heifetz, who's a, a professor at Harvard in the Kennedy School of Government. So it sounds like it's not related to dentistry, right? Um, but in fact, I think it's a very useful concept. So he says there's two types of problems that we confront. Technical problems, in which there is an existing technical fix for something, and the experts can just kind of give us that fix. It doesn't require any change on our part. Um, so if you think about um, climate, let's think about climate change for a bit. If you think about our use of fossil fuels in our cars, what would be a technical fix for that problem? Yeah, many ways to reduce your carbon footprint. Uh, okay, anyway, so uh, I'm thinking if I, you know, I have a long commute, commute for 45 minutes. I don't want to use as much gas, right? Get an electric car, all right? So great, let the engineers design a better car. I can still live out in Solon. I can still drive in a one per, you know, solo every day, back and forth. And magically, my problem is fixed, right? It doesn't require any change in my behavior. So the other type of problem is an adaptive problem. This is a problem where it's going to require change or adaptation on the part of people. So can anybody think of an adaptive solution to my car problem? Carpool. Carpool, move closer, 
right? All of those things are going to require some effort on my part. Which type of problems do you think people like best? Technical problems, right? I have this problem. Please, experts, solve it for me, and I will go away and be happy and continue to do my life exactly the way I have always done it. Right? We all want that. Very few of us enjoy adaptive problems because why? We have to change. How many of you like to change? No one's raising their hand. We've had a lot of change recently, right? We're done. Um, so, yeah. So, if you think of dentistry, and you think of the types of problems that our patients bring to us, they fall into these two buckets, right? So, a cavity. Technical problem or adaptive problem? Technical, why? Easy to fix. Because you, you just about restore the, the function of the function of the Right, so that particular cavity, I can restore. You're done. Takes about anywhere from 15 minutes to three hours, depending on your <laughs> skill level, right? Um, and uh, you can walk out the door, and it's over. Now, the problem carries, however, future carry solutions. Is that a technical problem or an adaptive problem? That's adaptive, right? So um, it falls into two bucks. And an eye treatment. I come in, acute pulpitis, I'm in pain, you do the root canal, technical problem, right? Great, I'm done. What I would say though is, complete dentures, things like periodontal disease, adaptive problems, why? Are they gonna require something on our patient's part? What do they require? Sorry. Oral hygiene. Oral hygiene. Cooperation. Cooperation. Following recommendations. I think the hardest thing is it, not technology so much, but complete denture certainly requires a change in expectation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like losing that arm. Oh, there's so many things you can do, and now oh, you can't do almost anything. So you have to completely change how you perceive your reality, what is and what is not feasible. Every time you walk into a place to eat now, you got to scan for what's in and what's out. So that all these little changes require um, a little different way, I guess. Yes, well stated. So it requires a change in my expectations about what I can do, what I can eat, how I talk. I'm going to have to be patient while I adapt. I'm going to have to come in and get the denture adjusted. Um, maybe it's painful initially until the adjustments are done. I'm going to have to learn, retrain my neuromuscular um, apparatus. So, neuromuscular adaptation, motivation, coping skills, social support, these things are all going to be required for your patient to adapt optimally. And that you can't do for them. They're going to have to participate in this. So I hope, I, I wanted you to appreciate that because I think it's really helpful to think about <coughs> technical versus adaptive and when a patient comes to you, which, which bucket does it fall into? All right. Now, which, which kind of problems do you think we enjoy fixing for people? Technical. Ah, technical, why? More control. It's more control, right? How many people like control? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, that's why we don't like change, right? Because we like control. And so for us, um, a lot of times we would like to 100% solve the problem for someone, right? Very satisfying. I'm the hero. Um, but in this case, it really is going to be a partnership. And someone is going to be on your patient. So just keeping that in mind. All right. So I posted a paper um, by Fisk. The, it's, um, it was done in 1998. It is an excellent paper. It's, uh, it was done in Britain. It's in a British, British Dental Journal. It should be in Canvas. I would urge you to read this. It's a qualitative study um, where the investigators interviewed folks, patients who had become edentialists. 
and they ask them many, many questions about their experience. And what you can see in the paper, the reason I like it, is because it's a qualitative study, which means it's not a survey, it's not numbers, it's the patient's actual own words. And so you can see what these people said about their experience in their own words. And it's really, really um, very helpful to think about the range of reactions that people have. So uh, Bergendahl, in the late 80s, did, this was in Sweden, they did a study where they asked people to, adults, to rate the seriousness of various life events. And losing your teeth, <laughs> losing your teeth and getting dentures in their results, both ranked more difficult to adjust to than marriage, retirement, or job change. So people really felt like this was a very significant event in their lives. Ah, let's talk about it. So the impact tooth loss, this is an irreversible loss, right? This is, we talked about losing a limb, losing teeth, other types of loss. And how many people are familiar with kubler ross of stains of the brain model? Anybody? Okay, maybe from undergrad, you may have learned this. So this was, she developed this way back. It's been modified a little bit since then. But the, the foundation is that trying to understand the kind of stages that people go through when they're confronted by loss. So her first stage is denial. This can't be happening. I'm, I'm in disbelief. I'm going to withdraw. I'm just going to hold up, sit on my couch. I can't believe it. The second stage is anger. I'm angry with myself, and I think there was a comment up front about why didn't I floss? Okay? <coughs> when you read through the Fisk paper, you're going to see that the comments fall into these various stages of grief. And one of the comments one of the patients makes is, I can't believe I let this happen to myself. Why didn't I take better care of my teeth? Why didn't I go to the dentist? So I'm angry at myself. They also say, some of the patients, I was angry at the dentist. So sometimes you're going to have patients who are going to react toward you, right? Why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you prepare me for this? I'm mad. They're in this anger stage. Third stage is bargaining. This is where you kind of try to rationalize it to yourself. Um, make it, you know, oh, I guess I have to live with this. Maybe it's not so bad, etc. Depression. Then people, as they realize this change is irreversible, this is a permanent loss, they become sad, they become depressed. So some of your patients are going to be in this stage. And finally, the last stage is acceptance. Okay, I'm ready to deal with this. Now you would hope that the folks coming to you would be in the acceptance stage, right? You would hope that all your patients by the time you're ready to make them their prosthesis would be an acceptance because that would make, make it a lot easier. But just be aware that not everybody's going to be there. And not everyone even gets there ever. So you're going to have people in a range of, of situations. Um, and being sensitive to, okay, I understand what you're going through. All right, so let's talk about impact. Um, Tooth loss, obviously we talked, and I think you guys identified several factors. So impacts appearance and function, as we know. Mouth is a highly visible area, right? It's one of the first things you notice about someone, the face in general, and teeth. Many of the patients in the FISC study talked about not feeling like they looked the same after they lost their teeth, and even when they had their denture, they said, I just feel like I look different, and that was hard to accept. Um, body image is obviously, particularly in the United States, a big deal, right? We're inundated with images, there's a cultural valuing of youth, vigor, beauty um, that we, we see. Now, things happily, things are changing and becoming broader. That ideal of what defines an ideal appearance is becoming broader and broader, and hopefully that will continue. But there's still these, these messages, and so this really impacted people um, their body image. And many patients said, this was a symbol of the loss of my youth. I didn't, I think, so that's another loss, right? It's not just the teeth, it's the loss of my idea of myself as a young person, right? as a vital person. Um, one patient said, I just didn't feel whole even years after. 
also another impact on key daily activities, um, including eating. So patients talk about the choice of food, and you guys brought this up, the enjoyment of food, eating in public. We know that, that going out for dinner or eating with people is a big way that people socialize with each other, and so those social interactions were um, affected in speech, how I had to adapt to, to how I talk. Smiling, I'm a big smiler. If I couldn't smile, it would be really hard for me to navigate my daily life, right? Because my immediate response to anybody is smile. Um, and other people would react, right? If I spent the last 10 years smiling at you every time I saw you and suddenly I'm not smiling, what's going on? Right? Our interaction changes. Laughing, anybody like to laugh? So patients, and how many of us like to laugh spontaneously? Right? So patients would say, I had to kind of be on guard, right? I didn't want my denture to kind of come loose, or I didn't want my dentalistness to show. And so I had to be on guard by spontaneous laughing change. Eating and nutrition changed. A couple of studies. Um, one patient said, if you're eating amongst other people, you do feel self-conscious because you have to think while you're eating. You really can't take your mind off your denture. So really a little bit of distraction, right? Going on another, another track running in your mind at all times. There are effects on diet and nutrition. A couple of studies. Um, Jack Raymer did a study in 2007. She used NHANES data. It included a 24-hour dietary recall. And she was looking to answer the question, does the dentalistness impact diet and nutrition? And so the conclusions, people with fewer than 2018 had significantly lower intake of carrots, tossed salads, dietary fiber than did fully dentate people, and lower serum levels of beta carotene, folate, and vitamin C. Inclusion of dental status significantly affects diet and nutrition. So, and this has obviously a health impact. Another study, uh, this I think was done in Sweden, um, comparing a dentalist to dentate uh, individuals. The dentalist men and women ate more sweet snacks compared to those who still had teeth. The dentalist men also ate less fruits, vegetables, and fiber. And the dentalist women ate more fat than dentates. So, real actual impacts on potentially on health. Impact on self-confidence. The patients talked about what this did to their self-confidence. I think several of you talked about um, self-image and self-confidence. It's given me an inferiority complex, which I have never lost. Pretty, pretty significant. Impact on work life, right? My confidence, my ability to stand up here in front of you guys today, right? That depends on my self-confidence. If that's diminished, that impacts my work. And you can imagine in meetings, going out to see clients, you know, many, many work situations where this would be important. Lots of comments <coughs> related to both social life, um, including romantic relationships, and how this impacted if they felt that they had this secret that they had to hide from their romantic partner. Um, I guess they call them personal relationships. Um, one patient said, I don't think my husband knew that I had false teeth for years. I only took them out to clean, so he never knew. This is the person who's closest to you in the world, right? And you've got to you feel that you have to keep this secret. So and that struck me. Emotional impacts. So secrecy, like I said, um, guilt and shame, right? How did I let this happen? I'm, I'm less than. Anxiety and lack of social support. You'll, if you read the article, you'll see that the patient said, I didn't feel that I could talk to people about this. I didn't feel that I could share. And what's the one thing, when we're going through difficult times, what's the thing that gets us through usually? Support. Support. Talking to our friends, our family. How many of you have used support through your dental school journey? Any of you ever talked to your friends or family about your dental school experience? Raise your hand if you have. Anybody not? Just go solo? <laughs> I don't need any help. Uh, so you know, you know that having that social support, being able to talk about difficulties really helps. And yet people were saying I didn't feel 
like I can talk about this. Now, this was in 98, right, when this paper was done. So that was about 20 years ago. So it's unclear how things have changed. And if things have changed, they may be certainly we talk about a lot more things openly in society now, so maybe things are changing. Um, I don't know. Uh, difficulty accepting. Uh, okay, so this is interesting. In the study, and um, Fisk Davis in 2000, I didn't post that paper for you, but I can, they did a follow-up study. And so they're both really good papers. What they found was that many patients felt unprepared for tooth loss and dentures. So they didn't fully feel that they understood the impact on their appearance and the impact on their function. And so the authors conclude that what we can do as providers is really make sure that we're giving information, we're giving it in advance, we're giving it in multiple forms. So maybe I'm saying it to you, but I'm also giving you a handout to take home. Maybe I have it on my website. Any number of ways that people can um, access information. And then we're encouraging our patients to talk to other people who might have gone through the same thing, right? To seek out that social support and seek out that understanding of what's this really going to be like. There was fear of taking dentures out in public um, when people wanted to retain their dignity. Um, there was one patient who said, uh, I had major surgery, and the first thing I thought of when I woke up from the anesthetic was what? Where are my teeth? It wasn't in the, did my major surgery go okay? Where are my teeth? You need to put them in. So, all right. So, the question is, any, any comments or questions at this point? All right. So the question is, can we predict adaptation difficulties in advance? Can we figure out, because some people are not going to struggle with this, and some people are, right? So you're going to have patients who, it's very easy, they're like, thanks, this is great, I'm good to go and other people who continue to struggle. So can we predict that in advance? So there are conflicting results. Um, part of this is hampered by kind of poor study design, small sample sizes, questionable design, et cetera. Um, and so first of all, people said, well, can, can you look at demographic factors? Is there a particular population group that has trouble adapting to dentures? And what I would include based on literature is that no, you can't predict based on age, gender, or SES, the typical demographic factors. So then Fenlon, um, where, where they give you a case, well, um, in 2007 published a very nice paper where they looked at personality factors. So is there a particular personality type that struggles with this? And the interesting thing they found was that they gave um, the, I think of the official name, um, the five-factor personality test, and the, one of the factors is neuroticism. Okay. Anybody feel like they're neurotic? Okay, okay. there's probably a fair number of us in this group who are actually, if we all took the test. Um, so what this is a very interesting result. What they found is that patients who tended to have personality that was stronger in neuroticism were less satisfied with their dentures and they followed them at three months and two years, less satisfied, but they didn't use the denture any less. So they used it, they just reported that they were happy and that persisted. Okay. So personality possibly plays a role. Um, and so here's the result. Neuroticism is negatively associated with satisfaction, but not with use of the dentures. So then, um, PADAC, this is a group at the University of Michigan, um, very nice group, and they did a very well-designed study where they looked at oral health-related quality of life and denture use. And what they found was that wearing complete dentures does impact quality of life, okay? And it, it has a little bit of a negative impact. Um, but that how the patient copes with this actually matters. So receiving comfort and understanding from others was a predictor of greater quality of life. Okay, so the message, the takeaway message for you is social support, getting the right social support, encouraging your patients to get the right social support actually matters. Right. Two studies in Australia where they said, hey, um, you know, these patients are coming in, they're complaining 
about their dentures, they say they can't adapt to them, what's going on? And what they found was that there were actual real design faults in both studies. So if your patient says something's not right, your default response should be to believe them, right? Um, not to dismiss them as neurotic or dismiss them as hard to get along with or whatever. Um, and the same thing, uh, the Fenton group did a study similar objective. They found the quality of the prosthesis and quality of the residual, residual alveolar ridge were predictors of denture use. So, makes sense, right? Better denture, better ridge, more use. Um, and that patient personality was not as, not as important. All right, so what should you be thinking about? Possible signs of future difficulty, just in general, with patients. So, does this patient disrupt your normal office routine or refuse to follow it? Do they ask for special rules for them? Might be a red flag. Do they have an extreme reaction to normal exam procedures? Again, might be a red flag. Did they not pay for previous dental treatment? And this is usually a sign that they weren't happy. If there's a pattern of that, then you want to just have that in the back of your mind, right? What's going on? They have legal action pending with their previous dentist. Again, you want to understand what's going on. Previous inability to prevention. So you want to know what you're getting into and be analyzing the situation very carefully. And talk about a little bit about your reaction. So this is an article by Gamer in 2003. Really looked at what's on the provider side of this, what's going on with providers. And these authors say that there are three things that we want as people. We have a desire to be liked and admired. How many people would agree with that? How many people would agree? Do you want to be liked? Yeah. <laughs> do you want to be admired? Do, do you want people to think you're a good dentist? Yes. Okay. Um, do you want to be respected as an authority? Do you want people to think you know what you're talking about when you give them advice? Yes. Um, and desire to be in control. We talked a little bit about that. So we all kind of want these things, right? I want to be liked and admired. I want to be respected for my expertise. And I want to feel like I'm in control. If you have a patient who is struggling to adapt to a denture, and they're coming back to you multiple times saying it's still not right, what does that do to these things? I think that would depend on the personality, you know. Everyone's response to the phrase, you suck, is different. You know, in my own case, a uh, shoulder shrug is my general response. But, you know, for some people, that's going to be a pretty high blood pressure event. So I think it depends to what degree um, the person is, is able to distance your dissatisfaction from that equates a loss of respect or <coughs> You're unhappy with the denture. All right, that might not necessarily be unhappy with me, but for some people, the one and the two are the same. Ah, so. uh, well stated. Did everybody hear that? You're unhappy with the denture. That may not mean you're unhappy with me, right? Those things you said, those things are not, for some people in the provider's minds, those things are the same. They overlap. If you're unhappy with my treatment, you're unhappy with me. You're happy with my treatment, it's my fault. So trying to be aware of that, right? Because you will get unhappy patients for a variety of reasons. Sometimes they're unhappy because you legitimately made a mistake, right? Sometimes they're unhappy and you did everything right. And so being able to, in your mind, be aware of what's going on with you and understand that, and I think you said it very nicely, there's individual variation in this. Some people can handle criticism very, very well, and it doesn't, it doesn't hit their core. Other people, not so much. How many people are, find they can easily handle criticism? No problem. Okay. How many people say, oh, I would prefer not to be criticized ever again in my life? <laughs> Right? Okay, I put myself in that category, right? No thanks, you know, I'm good, I don't need to approve, no, no one can start to be that. So this, this can hit us very differently. 
And this is why we like technical problems, right? Because we can fix it, it's done, everybody's happy, we preserve our authority, our expertise, the patient's happy, etc. So just be aware of what's going on on your side of the equation. Because there's emotions going on on your patient's side, right? They're struggling to adapt. But there's also the impact on you. And I just want you to be aware of that and, and um, kind of mindful about your response. All right. So the common pitfalls, what can you run into? Inadequate data gathering up front, not understanding your patient's history, right? How has their previous prosthetic treatment gone? Um, understanding the full picture of what's going on in their life. Unrealistic expectations, you really want to get a sense of what their expectations are and then have that conversation about are those, are those realistic. Um, and a common, common trap providers fall into is that when a patient raises an issue, says, this still isn't working for me, I'm struggling, the provider will lack empathy. And then things start to circle the brain, drain, right? Because really often when people are upset, about 80% of what they want is to be heard, right? To be listened to. And so 20% um, they want you to do something, but about 80% they just want to feel like you understand. And sometimes that's enough. They'll say, oh, and they'll complain for about three minutes, and then you say, okay, what can I do? They'll say, nothing, right? Good, I just wanted you to know. So, but not doing that listening, not demonstrating that empathy will get you into trouble. Because that's when the relationship becomes fractured, and now the patient starts to think it's your fault, right? So you want to go on this journey with them. You don't want them, you don't want to turn it against them. All right, um, thinking about timing and ability to cope for your patients. So do they have good social support in place? Do they have people to talk to? Are there any other major life events going on? And we know that what's going on in the rest of our life uh, impacts how well we cope with a certain challenge. And so has there been a recent death in the family? Is there an illness? Is there a divorce? Is there retirement? All those things that could make it bad timing to try to add in another challenge. Um, and then thinking about mental health concerns. What's my patient's kind of overall uh, mental health status? Um, we know that depression is prevalent. Um, and more and more our dental patients are going to be older, right? Because they're of the generation that lost a lot of teeth. This younger generation not losing teeth at the same rate. Um, and so thinking, you know, being on the lookout for signs of depression as well. All right. Any comments or questions? And I know you guys are a ways away from feeling like you're actually in the clinic, right? So hopefully you can keep some of these ideas in your mind for about a year until you get there. And then I hope you can, you know, at least one or two things you can pull out and say, oh yeah, I remember that. Empathy. I got to do empathy. Okay. So that's, that's what I hope for. You're lovely. Thank you.